Hi, how are you? I'm great. Good morning. Uh, good to hear you. <laughs> Is everything well and healthy over there? Yes, everything's good. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you've got to treat me quite tenderly this morning because this is the first time I've ever done a webinar. So, <laughs> I'm going to say I'm a, a bit of a webinar virgin. Um, so, so how, how do we proceed? <laughs> <laughs> wow, welcome for your first Instagram Live. I think this is maybe an opening door for you to do it more of the next time after this. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And so, Mr. Colin, I think uh, nice to meet you. This is the very first time Likewise. that I see you face to face, virtually. Okay. But yeah, um, maybe some of us uh, hasn't really know you personally yet. Okay. Especially right. me too. So, would you like to introduce yourself? Fantastic. Okay, let me talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in this industry for for almost four decades. So uh, that means I started around about five or six. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, but you know, the, uh, the my my kind of uh, my background was with design. Uh, I started off in you know kind of developing identities, corporate identities, and things like this. And I've moved kind of into the strategy area uh, out of you know really out of an interest that I've kind of uh, learned over you know over these kind of three decades. Uh, I've been in Asia now uh, since about 19, uh, 1989. Um, so I've kind of like been around the region, seen a lot of things, uh, worked with a lot of brand owners uh, across Asia. Um, and, you know, they all share a very common uh, uh, trait, which is that they really don't understand a, a lot about the emotional side uh, of branding. And funny enough, you know, when we're using this as a title, um, it's kind of interesting that I think of all branding uh, as emotional um, and um, you know it's kind of my, my favorite topic so hopefully I won't bore everybody in, in the next hour when I talk about it um, but I have two key roles I, I work as the uh, strategy director of uh, Equus uh, Design um, and I also work as a, I have my own business which is called Brand Courage so I'm the MD of that so you know I'm kind of in, in two places always at the same time but um, they lead me to the same kind of thing which is really that uh, I have a very kind of overview perspective of how uh, emotional branding uh, can add value to businesses. And, and uh, I don't know if you, uh, in, in, before you were talking a little bit about uh, about what we were going to do, you mentioned the fact that um, for me, and I look at Indonesia, um, there's a huge gap uh, there in an understanding of what this is. And, you know, uh, that means that really for those people that kind of become early adopters of using the emotional side of branding, that can create your huge opportunity. Uh, you know, you only have to look at what the, the, the international brands do and you can see how, you know, successful they are at building leadership, uh, and, you know, building differentiation by the fact that they really understand, you know, what goes on in the sloppy wet stuff between people's ears. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, and uh, as I said, you know, I, I, I'm the th third speaker, I believe you spoke to, you spoke to Andrew, uh, Andrew Thomas, uh, who is our, our managing partner, and also Wira, uh, who um, is heading up strategy in Indonesia. Both of those are, are very incredible uh, people to work with. Uh, I really mm -hmm. enjoy that kind of relationship where you learn off other people and you know there's there's always that experience that you get from doing fresh projects and seeing new things um so you know maybe they were saving you know the best for last to die <laughs> <laughs> I doubt yes. it, but you know, uh, I you know, I kind of always oh, so nervous. Maybe they can kind of like you know, they set that they set the, the bar very very high. So I, I'm going to I have to to do very well. Um, you know, another thing that I, I would like to mention is for me my kind of personal kind of ma mantra. And I think you know when you you know do whatever you do, and in your case you call yourself higher purpose. So I find that very interesting. You know that you are looking uh, at how you know branding can make a positive impact, and that's what I would believe when I read that name. For me, my my kind of mantra is uh, that uh, fortune favors the brave. And uh, you know, I was I was using this a lot long long lot before um, John Wick. Um, I, I don't know if you know that movie. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, you know that. And he has it all tattooed on his back, right? He has it tattooed yeah. in Latin. It says, "Futurus, futura, uh, at, at, at that, at that." And uh, 
you know, it means the same thing. Um, but um, I was using it before him. Um, point being that I think that, you know, um, especially in these times of uh, COVID-19, um, and this is probably, you know, my fourth or fifth uh, sort of alliteration of having global, you know, a global problem that, you know, how do you survive? And, and you know, brand is a fantastic tool. And people yeah. sometimes, you know, in Indonesia are saying specifically, um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity there for you to, to, to build build upon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, does that kind of explain me a little bit? Totally. <laughs> like, thank okay, you so okay. much for really introduce about who you are. And, cool. Uh, like you said, I think, oops, sorry about that. Two of your okay. colleagues has done really great. I mean, have mm. done really great job. And I believe that today, even though this is like the third series and maybe the last session of EQ's team, okay. but I believe that it's, we are saving the best for the last. So okay. apparently, um, like you said, like some of the Indonesian brand owners uh, still somehow undervalue this emotional um, emotional benefits that they are mm. actually approaching. And somehow, I think it impacts on their brand positioning as well because mm. more uh, they will remain heavily into the, their USP and some mm. of the USPs might not include any emotional aspects to it. And, you know, uh, like just now you say that your mantra, I believe that yeah. there is a famous quote in the world that says mm. that people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Mm. So especially I think feeling or yeah, emotions are connected. So mm. in this new vernacular, it creates the first mover opportunity for those who are willing to actually innovate mm. and how to fuel them with this emotional benefits. So yeah. maybe we can scratch it out from the very first beginning. And okay. maybe can you try to explain to us like what's the definition about emotional branding? Okay. So um, as I said before, it's kind of interesting that I, I believe that all branding is emotional. Um, so when you talk about people talking about USPs as being very rational, what they're, yeah. what they're doing is focusing on what I call the what's of their business. Um, and, you know, everybody has, uh, you know, infrastructure, they have people, they have products, they have services. Everybody has this. Unfortunately, what happens is if you're in that vernacular and you talk about uh, – uh, your what, um, you're, you're really going to find that everybody else does the same. So yeah. when we start to build something more emotional, then we're going to step more into who and to why. And, um, you know, for me, maybe uh, you know, my starting point really is to say, so, you know, if you think about branding, what is the definition of branding? Uh, it's the management's long-term strategy um, for the uh, protection and exploitation of intangible assets for commercial gain, which sounds very, very technical. And I promise you, I won't do a lot of technical stuff, but what's, what to me it is, and a simpler way to explain it is, your brand is your reputation. Mm. It is your behavior. So those three things must be in alignment, brand, mm. reputation, behavior. Yeah. Um, it is really just a promise of value. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, um, I think, you know, Einstein says, and he, he, he says something like, uh, sometimes uh, what, what, uh, what counts can't be counted, and what can be counted doesn't count. And it's an interesting kind of flip over of the fact that tangible things, very rational things, tend to be things that we count. Accountants can count them. They can count assets. They can put it on the balance sheet. They can depreciate it. But what... Uh, is hard to count. And everybody says to me, you know, so I'm going to do this branding exercise. What's the KPI? What's the return on investment? Mm. And it is very, very hard to quantify something that's intangible. That's what yeah. makes it intangible, right? Mm. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I, I kind of think about um, a great way to say this, uh, and I do this a lot in workshops when I get, you know, branding teams together, uh, when I'm working with, with large companies or small companies even. I say, yeah. sort of, so, imagine you have to buy a car. Mm. So you can say, um, you know, what would you choose your car based on? Would it be price, weight, fuel efficiency, engine size, torque, power? Yeah. 
um, acceleration, right? All key things. But something really different happens when I say to you, Mercedes, BMW, mm. Jaguar, Aston Martin, right? Yeah. You automatically make an emotional connection to those names. They True. are not just a name. They are something that you feel. You know, mm. maybe say, for instance, you know, no, maybe it's not all good. You know, uh, say, for instance, if you were driving along and you had a crash with a guy who drove a big, huge Mercedes and he got out and he gave you, you know, a, a very hard time. You know, you probably maybe even have a negative impression about Mercedes. And, you know, interestingly enough, you know, when you see movies and the, the product placement, you know, where they put all these cars, you connect, maybe you connect, uh, um, you know, uh, action movies with Audi, you know. And so, yeah. you know, when you come to choosing a car, oh, you know, I want to be in an action movie. I kind of want to have a, a muscle car or whatever. And you kind of connect those emotions to yourself. And that's yes. what I mean. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like um, another analogy would be like, uh, and again, I'm trying to step people into that, that zone of seeing emotions mm -hmm. as more important than the physical things. So mm -hmm. Harley, Day Harley Davidson. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm now approaching 60. So I'm that age where, you know, we, we, we feel kind of differently about life, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, so what, what, Har what do Harley Davidson do? Actually, they don't make bikes. They fulfill mm. dreams, right? They fulfill dreams. You know, similarly, if you talk about uh, a company like HSBC, what do yeah. they talk about? Uh, the world's most local bank. Yeah. What do you feel about that? You feel like, oh, well, they're global. They've got all this expertise, but they can deliver it to me in my neighborhood. They understand mm. me. You know, they're not so big, but they're not so small. And those are feelings that we get from the, uh, the way in which people or brands position themselves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and in, you know, an, an interesting kind of one in reverse kind of thing. Um, I was walking, in a walking past a boutique in, in KL. Um, this is obviously before COVID, right? Um, and it's, and it's uh, a shop called Off-White. I don't know if you're familiar with that brand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you are. Okay, okay. You, you look like you could be, right? So I looked in the window and there's this tout bag. Um, and uh, it looks like exactly like an Ikea bag. I mean, mm. it's, ye it's yellow. <laughs> it's got yeah. the straps. Uh, it's got little lighting on the straps. So I went inside and I said, um, so, you know, I know Ikea cost me about 90 cents one of these bags. So I said, so uh, how much is this bag? And they said, yeah. oh, uh, $295.90. <laughs> I said, okay. Mm. So that's it. Actually, if you think about intangibles and you think about emotions, actually, there is a kind of way in which you can measure it if you look at the price. You know, oh. What are you prepared to pay for that feeling? I mean, you, you take a bag. A bag is a bag. You can use it anywhere you want. You put things in it, right? Like a car. Yeah. A car takes you to a place, right? You can get yes. there you know, in the same amount of time, whether you're driving a Toyota or you're driving a, a Lamborghini. Well, maybe yeah. you can get there a bit faster. <laughs> But then you kind of worried, oh, maybe someone will scrape my car. You know, so you kind of like, you know, it, it, it's, this, it's a feeling that you have and it says something about yourself. And, wow. uh, you know, corporations and companies, when you think about going forward, you have to think about what feeling do you engender in people when they buy your products and services, when they work with you. Uh, and that's kind of where emotional branding sits. Mm. Mm. Wow, that's a thorough okay. explanation. Okay. Okay. But I really love it. Like the one that you said that how much are you willing to pay for that feeling and maybe then yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's how the ninety cents back and like you say the two hundred plus is so mm. different in the value. But Correct. it's not maybe about the quality, but it's just mm. about how the brand um somehow portray themselves outside in the market so but it's also what it says to you right it also says something about you like you carry that bag right so if you're carrying an ikea bag it says yeah. something about you if you're carrying the off-white version yeah. of the ikea bag it also says yeah. something about you so it's self-reflection as well mm. Mm. So I think uh, definitely like emotional branding, your personality as a user will be connected mm. to the brand that you're using, right? Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. And it's not just about products. 
you know, this is about, you know, everything and anything that you uh, use. And I mean, maybe, uh, uh, you know, there is kind of that, that balance between things. Of course, you know, may, maybe there are rational ways in which you choose things, but emotions drive a kind of higher purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. And they also work on a very subliminal level. You know, um, I often say that, you know, conscious thought runs at about 20 bits per second, right? That's the thought, the things that are conscious in your mind, right? You're looking at my face. Uh, you can see what's behind me. Uh, you know, um, you can hear my voice and, and you can hear my words. But there is also a whole lot of things happening in the background. Uh, yeah. eight, mi- eight million bits of information you're processing every second. Eight million, right? And what's that? the temperature of the room that you're in, the feeling of the clothes that you're wearing, you know, your heart is pumping at a certain rate and doing all these things. Everything's happening around you. What you thought, what you had, what you want to have for breakfast, what you had to want to have for dinner, what you, yeah. what your, what your partner shouted at you last night when he was very angry, right? Yeah. All these things are going on in your head. Uh, and they are kind of almost automatic functions. So, you know, if I was trying to talk to you about what is the difference between yeah. rational and emotional, let's, let's kind of weigh that up. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of also use a little bit of a kind of thing when, especially in workshops, when I get, when I want to bury this into people's heads, I say, you know, if you think about Homer Simpson, you know, Homer Simpson, right? From the Simpsons, right? You know what character he is, you know? Him? No. no. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, okay. So Homer is kind of like a character who kind of uh, doesn't really want to do much. He's very lazy. So he says, uh, if it's too hard to do, it's not worth doing. And if you put that from the point of view of uh, our brand owners, brand owners think that everybody's thinking about their brand, yeah. but they're not. Actually, what people are thinking about is sex, donuts, and sweet, sweet beer, right? Oh. Right. Uh, and you know how does that translate i mean if you think of it from the point of view of if you're going to a shopping center you're going to a, you're going to the supermarket if you had to physically choose every single product that you wanted to put into your shopping basket mm-hmm. a shopping trip will take you eight hours yeah but the but the truth is that you've already made up your mind before you've even gone there you know exactly what you want so Again, if you think about it purely from a product perspective, and sometimes we call this the last, the last three feet of the wall, is that when someone is standing in front of the shelf and they decide to pick this product or they pick that product, what will sway them? Because they've already made up their mind. They, yeah. know, what, they know what breakfast cereal they want. They know what hair, hair shampoo they're going to use. Uh, they know, uh, you know what, what brand of toothpaste they love. They know which brand of toothpaste they don't love, you know, uh, and those kind of things are automatic. People have an automatic uh, prerequisite that's in their heads. So when you're a new brand and you're launching a new brand, it's very, very hard to cut through all of that clutter. Mm. Uh, You know, in in the kind of 60s and the 50s, you know, I mean, you think about products again they did a lot of rational sell you know they could they could sell based on irrational differences it's like you know you can you can you can get this many more loads out of your washing or you know it it, it adds this particular flavor to smell to the clothing these are all very functional benefits but you know now consumers don't buy products yeah. what they do is they join them okay? mm. they share they share them with, they share them, they discuss them, they endorse them, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you think now, I mean, maybe, you know, KOL, uh, KOLs, uh, key opinion leaders, you know, it's a little bit long in the tooth now because a lot of them paid to say what they say. But, you know, those ones that are very credible, you want to hear it from somebody else. You want to be- you believe it because somebody else said it. Um, you know, think about hotels, right? Think about TripAdvisor. Yeah. You know, when I look at a hotel, we, we're going to stay in a hotel, I, I don't look at their glossy websites anymore. I yeah. go to TripAdvisor and I look at the pictures taken by other people that have been there. Why? Because that's, it's not being photoshopped. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's what it is. And, and what do they say about the service? What do they say about, uh, you know, the facilities? What do they say about the location? What do they say about the way in which you're treated? All yeah. those things uh, are more important uh, and again, you know, it gives you the feeling of what the experience would be yes. like. 
um, again, just thinking about from, you know, from how do brand owners sort of start to harness this? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I think that, you know, um, I often say to them, if you were a superhero, yeah. what would be your superpower? And it's quite interesting, you know, how people kind of uh, think about their brands. They think of them very kind of monochromatically. And I'm trying to get them to think in a very different, different way. Um, you know, uh, an experience that I had, I mean, again, you know, I kind of, you know, I always was very afraid of going into these very high end boutiques. Mm. And uh, it was actually my, my partner. She, she sort of, she loves all these brands and she looks at them you know, every day. It's like a, it's to her, it's like a job looking online <laughs> and, and, and reviewing every, every one of their products, you know, it's everything, what their price card point are and everything like this. But, you know, say for instance, you know, and one of her brands, fake brands is Burberry. So you go into these, these boutiques or, or into Louis Vuitton, right? And you kind of feel like, oh, you know, will they look at me like, oh, you can't afford our product. And that's the feeling you get sometimes. But actually, when you when you meet these people and the way they greet you and the way you're treated, it's very quick you see why they're so successful. Um, yeah. They really understand how to make people comfortable. They know how to make you feel positive about what they're selling. Um, and, you know, uh, for me, you know, because I deal now deal with a lot of luxury hotels, or lots, of, lots of kind of high-end things, I wanted to know for myself, okay, so when I purchase something high-end, what does that feel like? So, you know, I wasn't sort of, you know, I stayed in lots of you know, high-end hotels now, but my yeah. first experience actually was with Hugo Boss. Mm. Um, and so I went to Hugo Boss, uh, you know, and, you know, you look at the shirts and you realize that, you know, so the step up here is G2000, mm, $50, yeah. uh, Hugo Boss, $500 for a shirt. And, yeah. you know, it's a lot to pay. But, okay, so I went through that experience because I wanted to know how it felt, mm. how they treat you. And what mm -hmm. are, what is, you know, somebody, Hugo Boss has been doing this for a long, long time. I mean, you know, they've, they've been around for, for decades. So what is it about the experience of that high-end luxury brand that makes them worth the price point? Like you were saying about the bag, what is yeah. the difference between the 90 cents Ikea, uh, Ikea bag and the 295, 90 cents uh, off-white bag? It's yeah. the experience. It's the way you feel and the way they feel. And, you know, so putting on a $500 shirt makes you feel very differently about yourself. Maybe yeah. it gives you more confidence. Maybe it's something, you know, a little bit sort of a, gives you a bit of a sort of, a, you know, an uplift. I don't know what it is, but that's kind of like where, where that is. And then I think when you think about rational versus emotional, mm. well, that's kind of, uh, again, an important difference that we have to consider as brand owners. Yeah, wow, that's very interesting. And this is something I think a differentiation that I haven't heard before because like I think brand tends to just go with uh, the rational part rather than mm. try to somehow infuse and merge in the emotional mm. aspects. And what you said was so true that it really relies on the brand experience. Like mm. if uh, I remember last time when I think it was like eight years ago, 2012, but I was in New York and I tried to just do window shopping thing because yeah. I, I, I have no budget to just buy things yeah. out there. Uh, so when I went there and like you said, when you went to the Hugo Boss store, I went to a Bali store. Mm. So that Bali store was very huge. Like I think it's in Fifth Avenue and I don't really right. want to buy Bali. <laughs> I don't really yeah. use it, but I just yeah. want to experience it. So when mm. I come in, there's like a very scary calmness that I never mm. <laughs> experienced. Like yeah. it feels very, very like a cool hands kind of thing. So wow. when I enter in, I know that I'm not going to buy, right? But I just want to ask mm. things out and blah, blah, blah with my, I think 2012, I'm only, I think 20, 21 years old. Mm. So right there when I went there and then mm. all, the I think customer service people I was like huge you know like if you went to the club ushers those big big people there and mm. all are guys like mostly mm. and when mm. I see them I was like okay how do I talk to this person <laughs> so tall and it, it makes me like there's a mm. this detachment directly 
even though wow. I know that uh, whenever like let's say professional or maybe mm -hmm. corporate people just jump in there they will definitely just greet them all the way but looking at this I think little girl just wandering all the way in here <laughs> and try mm -hmm. to just be curious about stuff there. I think they have that um, somehow standing point of a, okay. of a brand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so okay. it's, it's really interesting to, to, to just shop in places that you've never been mm -hmm. before. I mean, maybe this leads me to an interesting thing that, uh, say, for instance, you know, when I was in New York last time, uh, which was, uh, I think, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, I went to the, the Nike store. Uh, and they have like a five-story uh, um, building in Soho, um, and it's it's fabulous. I mean, and I think you know that a lot of people say you know that, that retail, uh, the retail experience is, is uh, you know in re in a recession kind of thing where you know everybody's shopping online. Um, mm -hmm. And what it is is you know if you look at it again from an emotional perspective, is that you know the the the, the shopping gallery. You know their their flagship store is so you know amazing, um, and you can't help but um, you know think you know high, highly positive things about their brand and how they kind of have so many things to look at. You know, and maybe you're not there to buy, but what you're there to do is to be inculcated in this. You're there mm -hmm. to absorb the kind of culture and uh, get uh, and build a kind of uh, relationship with the brand so you know um and again you know maybe talking about something like burberry the burberry store is exactly the same if you look at the online experience versus the store what they try to do there is try to mirror that and oh. you know you walk into a store it's almost it gives you that kind of sense of the feeling of the brand and <clears throat> that's where i think you now again emotion plays a very very important part yeah. um I mean, you know, again, thinking about, you know, how things have changed. And it's not just, you know, between, you know, online and offline, but also thinking about what's been going on with COVID. And it's changed a lot of things. Um, I kind of think about uh, what Darwin said um, about survival. You know, he says it's not the strongest. He says it's not the most intelligent, but it's the most adaptive to change. So uh, brand owners also have to adapt. And part of that adaptation must be, you think about, uh, changing your strategy and your strategy should involve emotions um yeah. a, another story i love to do this story uh again in workshops and it's it's kind of one you you're familiar with star wars right yeah of course okay <laughs> i don't know okay um okay so you, you know in star wars there's the imperial mm. okay so that you know it's dark vader and the imperial yeah. right so you know they kind of they invent the death star and this is big, huge thing that's going to blow up planets, right? So somehow the rebels get the plans and then they destroy the, web, the, the Death Star. So, you know, that happened, I think, in episode four. And, you know, if you watch Rogue One, then you know how they got the plans, right? So, you know, it's hard work. It's not easy what they do, but they yeah. actually achieve something. So what do, what's the response by the, the Imperial? They yeah. build an even bigger Death Star, Oh. And then, and then the rebels go there and they blow it up again. And mm -hmm. I think, I think there's a third one, a third alliteration where they develop the death planet, you know. And yes. then, of course, the rebels blow that up. What's wrong there is that they are applying the same strategy, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't yield any results. So yeah. you know. You know, when you think about uh, the, the question about, uh, and this is the most important question that I ask brand owners to think about, is tell me why. Mm. Why do you exist? Uh, it sounds a very disarming question, a very simple and fundamental thing, but it's not. Actually, you know, maybe, you know, if Darth Vader turned to his stormtroopers and said, you know, you know, why do we exist? You know, maybe we should go out and ask the universe what they want us to do. Maybe yeah. they would have a very different strategy to building Death Stars. But yeah. again, you know, so let's return back to the, the, the question of why. Yes. Why do I exist? Why should people, why people choose me? Why am I relevant? Um, and uh, again, you know, maybe if I reflect on this personally, because, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't ask a brand owner to do it for, for their brand unless I kind of understand it for myself. Mm 
So mm-hmm. why do I exist? You know, yeah. you know, what's my why, my why positioning? Okay. So, you know, I see that, that I exist because uh, brand owners need to find their voice. They mm-hmm. need to reconnect uh, with what is really authentic to them. And mm-hmm. my role is to facilitate that, to help them to discover this. So in other words, for me, business only has two functions, mm-hmm. innovation yeah. and mar- marketing. And brand is kind of the driver for both of those, innovation mm-hmm. and marketing. Brand drives them both. So um, it's, you know, it's kind of like, in, if you think about this Me Too world where everybody has so many products and services, I mean, like, say, for instance, for us, you know, in Singapore, I have, you know, something like 250 other competitors, <laughs> You know, and that, that's quite normal, right? So, you know, in, in a global world, when you look at all the different people that there are doing everything, there is a lot of um, similarities. So, you know, when you ask yourself, why do you exist? When you ask yourself, what is it that I can provide? What, what can I do that's different? What do people really, really want? Um, actually, the first project I worked on with Andrew uh, and Equus was uh, they sent me out to um, Thailand to Phuket um, and I stayed at the Intercon Hotel where we were developing a, a value proposition for uh, what they call Tea Tree Spa and, um, and this was uh, to be launched in China. They were going to develop 100 spas. So they wanted to really have a clear idea of how to position the value proposition. So, you know, a little bit like webinars. Um, this is my first time going to a spa. I've never been to a spa before. You know, I'm a guy. I was then around my 40s. And, uh, you know, getting naked in front of somebody is kind of like, oh, gosh, you know. So I, 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 went, I went through all of this. And I, I came to the term, actually, I called it the spa virgin. I was the spa virgin. And what I learned from this is there's a huge opportunity for you know business hotels to offer spa treatments why why is it why is it important for guys like me you know i'm yeah. 40 years old i'm not maybe, maybe i'm there on a business trip what i get out of this is i feel relaxed i feel actually i feel you know when i went through the experience they were very discreet everything felt like i didn't feel like i was being examined under a microscope i was kind of like you know it was a great experience and i thought wow yeah. you know you know why can't we tell other guys you know you know businessmen like myself you know that despite the fact that you think it might be a little bit of a harrowing experience actually what you get out of it is you feel refreshed you feel rejuvenated and you feel ready yeah. to do business right mm-hmm. you do your best when you are you know, at ease with yourself so yeah. kind of that gave me then the value proposition of how we should talk about a spa. Mm. Again, aimed at a very specific group of people, which was like myself. Mm. So you can see how sometimes, you know, if you go through the customer journey and you, and you walk in their shoes, you can learn a lot from that. Um, yeah. So for me, an ex- a key part of, of helping brand owners to develop their brand is this kind of consensual process where I get them to feel it. They have to feel their own brands. They have to walk in the shoes of their customers. Um, mm-hmm. And to me, that is the starting point of, of every brand. Okay? Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think regarding about the one that you talk about, hotel and spa, I bet, because, like, uh, if I need to pick and choose, like, spas wherever in Jakarta, and mm. there's a lot. I mean, standalone spas or maybe hotel spas. But I always go to the hotel ones because mm. you know that hotel has a standard procedure in doing their hospitality. So basically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, pick something maybe that is standalone. But because of mm. they are well trained and somehow, like you say, hotel are meant for you to rest and have a peaceful accommodation. So I think that's one of the value that almost every hotel is trying to pursue for their yeah. customers. Too. But as a woman, you you wouldn't find that too. It would you wouldn't find that um, um, a, a difficult. There was no barriers for you. But I think also for you know for middle aged men, it, there might yeah. be a barrier. So therefore, if I'm able to lower the barrier by uh, somehow being able to get across the feeling that this is a you know this won't be a difficult experience then maybe they'll trial and you know in in the case of 
of any products and service, the difference between making people aware and then people trying it, trialing it is quite an important step. You know, you know, first people, if they have to know it exists, and like you say, you're in a hotel, you've got a, you've got a catchment there. People, you know, are uh, staying there. So you can, you know, you can send them a flyer, you can send them a, 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 you can send them a complimentary treatment, you can send them all sorts of things that will induce them to, to try this out. But once they've tried it and got over that kind of that initial, oh, okay, so that's what it's about, then you've got that, you may have them as a regular customer. And it can be a point of differentiation for a hotel that mm -hmm. says that they offer the best spa possible. And, you know, I stayed at the Dusit um, with a number of my friends and I'd heard that, you know, Dusit Hotel is like a fantastic spa. So, of course, I had to try that out and we all went yeah. and tried it out. And, you know, it is wonderful. But, you know, is it yeah. the best? No. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots that are really, really good. Um, yeah. But again, it's, it's that, that kind of getting over the initial part that is important and getting people to go, oh, I'm aware it's there. And then... The next part is I'm going to try it and I'm going to use it. And then the last part is, of course, I like the experience. I'm going to go back again. Mm. Mm. Right? Yeah. So um, maybe I talk a little bit about, you know, kind of like um, a, a little bit more of a kind of process, a little bit of a kind of mechanism, right? Um, yeah. When, you know, so really what I'm saying here is so when we do Big Developer Brand, we have kind of a clear agenda in mind. Um, and you know everybody has a way of process a system i call it the plan on the page because yes. you know, to me strategy with a big s sometimes is hard for brand owners to understand so this is strategy with a little s which makes it a lot more accessible okay i call it the um the five p's um and the five p's make up what i call the brand dna and just like you and i the reason we're different is because of our dna so yeah. what's different about the business if we say we answer the, the question why okay why we exist mm -hmm. that is actually one of the p's so they are purpose positioning personality promise and platform and wow. the first one personnel oh, sorry, stop, let's start off with purpose so purpose what are you for right if you yes. know what you are for if you can answer the why question then the next thing to ask is so who are you for what is your target audience you cannot yeah. be everything to everybody because otherwise you'll be nothing to nobody. So yeah. what's really important here is that you understand who you are talking to. It will affect yeah. you right down to your, your channel strategy. You know, everything aligns to that. If you know what your, your target audience feel about you or sure. what they feel about what you have to offer, then you have yeah. a better chance of connecting your purpose with theirs. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember, they don't buy your products. They mm -hmm. join you. So mm -hmm. that's the, really the first pillar. The second pillar mm -hmm. is positioning. Now, yeah. you'd be amazed how many people don't do this. No, mm -hmm. um, you know, sure. We had a, a, an example the other day where someone says, oh, we just want an e-brochure. Okay, okay, we can do an e-brochure. But do you know anything <laughs> about what everybody else is saying about the similar products? Do you understand your competitive landscape? Have you yeah. looked at what they're saying? Because if you don't understand what they're saying and how they talk about themselves, how can you truly be seen as an original brand, right? Mm. And mm. everybody True. thinks in the first instance about the rational things, right? Oh, yeah, we, we're the biggest, uh, we're the largest, we're, we're the smallest, uh, we're the cheapest, all that kind of stuff. But let's put that aside and say, so mm. if you look at what, how, who, and why, then you've got an idea of what everybody is up to in the marketplace. You can develop those USPs, as you said. What is the USP? And the USP may not be just a rational thing. Yeah. Also think about what do you know about the marketplace? What insights do you have? What changes are going to happen? Like, say, for instance, right now, what will happen after COVID? What will happen with the property market? You know, business. Yeah. If everybody had to work from home and they can function at home, I'm thinking, why do I need an expensive office? Right. Wow. <laughs> is, it, is it going to be a permanent thing or is it going to be a kind of, you know, like we go back to as we were those things we don't know. Nobody knows about this stuff. You know, after yeah. COVID, nobody knows. You talk to investment people, they don't know either. All right. So the third pillar mm -hmm. is personality. So, um, you know, so what do I mean by personality? I think about it almost like could be like tone of voice. 
how do I talk to my customers? What what language do I use? Am I am I a sophisticated brand? Am I a kind of dynamic brand? Am I kind of a smooth, silky kind of brand? Am I a kind of friendly, uh, colloquial brand? Am I an Indonesian brand or am I an international brand? All these kind of things. So, yeah. I mean, maybe for for myself. Okay, so I I come up with three attributes. Okay, so three attributes usually for me are something that will be rational, something yeah. emotional, and something relational. Okay, mm. so my three words are this. I am gutsy, grounded, and curious. Right? Mm. And that's what makes me who I am. Yeah. Um, and so when you say to a brand owner, you know, so what is the personality of your brand? And you kind of get through all of the, the general metaphors that they use. Because everybody says, oh, we are innovative. Okay, well, don't say that because everybody said it, you know, yeah. uh, you, know, we're, you know, we're trustworthy. Again, don't use it. Everybody uses it, right? Yeah. So we, we, we have to kind of develop what it is that those three things are. And these things are really interesting because they can actually affect the behavior. Remember, brand equals behavior equals reputation, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the behaviors of people? If you say, for instance, we are a very dynamic brand, but then mm -hmm. you go into to the, the – you ring up the business and you get, hello, you know, <laughs> what you want? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like, you know, Computer says no, you know, you know, you kind of have, you kind of, it, it's a disconnect, isn't it? So, you know, having these kind of things, it means that you have to live these values, right? You have to live these attributes. Um, so, you know, uh, that's kind of like a personality. When you think about the promise, so that's the fourth one, promise. Promise is really, you know, as we said, brand is a promise of future value. Um, I kind of wind this out to say, so what is my story? What is, yeah. what is the narrative that I'm going to tell people? What is my mantra? Um, and then that leads me down to a much more simpler thing that I take to the marketplace. What is my compelling truth? Mm. So it's an interesting thing, compelling and true. It must be compelling, exciting, but it also must be absolutely true. I must be able to deliver on it unequivocally every single time. Yep. Right? Without reservation. So like you say, Bali, you walked in there and they, it, was, it made you feel uncomfortable. Then they didn't deliver on their brand promise, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, or maybe their brand promises. We like to make young Indonesian girls, uh, when they come to New York, feel very uncomfortable. Then they didn't mm -hmm. fulfill their promise. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I doubt it, right? Okay, so here's, here's, here's an example of a brand promise or a compelling truth. Uh, think about Federal Express. You know yeah. who they are, right? Okay. Yeah. So their, their brand promise is we live to deliver. Mm. And, and how, do they, how do they personify that? It's, it's in their technology. It's their know-how. It's how they track parcels. You know that they can be trusted to deliver something because you can track it on your phone. You know where it is any time. And that philosophy also is like you get the sense that, you know, a little bit like in, in the way out west, you know, no, 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 just know what's going to happen if they're going to be attacked by Indians and, you know, aliens or whatever. They're still going to deliver their package. So the, the last one there is the platform. So the last P is the platform. This is to me is about the go to market strategy. Uh, how you're going to, you know, uh, reach out to your chosen few, right? You know, you're not for everybody, you're for your chosen yes. few. Uh, what is the channel of engagement? You know, so if they say, for instance, you know, and we, we did this with um, some cosmetic products. The target audience was young females uh, of between 16 and 18. So, you know, as a, as a, a, as a 50, 58 year old man, it's very hard to put myself in their shoes. So I actually sat down with a group of them and, you know, talked to them about the products and see what they feel about it. Show them the packaging, show them the packaging ideas, show them the different kind of configurations, show them yeah. colors, textures, the feel for the communications. And automatically then you get an idea. And I say, for instance, I said to them, so what magazines do you read? Mm, crickets, wow, no. crickets. They don't read magazines, right? No. Everything, everything's, everything's through, you know, YouTube. They watch yeah. all of these, um, you know, beauty, beauty, you know, um, uh, podcast and talking yeah. about, you know, what products to use and oh, here's a trial. This one, so of course, opens my eyes to a whole new bunch of stuff. 
And in order for me to really be effective in that, I have to kind of look and watch and understand how all of that fits together. But again, a lot of cust clients, you know, a lot of, you know, brand owners think that they are the decision maker. Oh, I own the business. Therefore, I will decide what colors, textures, what logo, what packaging exactly. shape. And they're not the target audience. And that is a big failure. So platform is really an, a, actually the last step. If you know what your purpose is, if you know your positioning, if you understand the personality and what it is you're going to promise, that then becomes a step that brings things in like design, mm. uh, brings in things like point of purchase, brings in things like the visual and verbal representation of your brand, uh, even down to something like how do I deal with complaints? Mm. So, you know, and I mean, you know, some brands I, I, I love to talk about when I talk about this is, say, for instance, you take um, Amex. Amex is the, has the best recovery record in the financial industry. It doesn't matter how many times I cut up my card. Yeah, yeah. They have a way of getting me back on board. Um, and then, you know, again, it's, this is a very conscious thought. People have put a lot of time and energy into it. So, say, for instance, I read this article recently, a uh, quite kind of interesting one about Apple. So I don't know if you know it, but, you know, when you look at product placement and you think about all the products you see in movies, mm -hmm. there's never, ever a bad guy who's holding an Apple phone. True. Yeah. Right? Why? Yeah. Because they consciously thought about that. Bad guys don't use m Apple phones. Only the good guys do. Because they want you to feel that you're the good guy good and you mind. should have the Apple phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> interesting isn't it yeah it's a kind yeah, of right yeah. oh wow oh, okay i didn't sort of see that one coming yeah, yeah. but that's again you know, um I, I you know the article is very interesting you know it's kind of it's a bit of an eye opener to how people kind of see these things so um the other you know, kind of, next kind of kind of question that people all always ask and you say so here's five p's um how do you kind of how do you kind of activate this? Uh, it's, it's not kind of like a, a, a simple thing to do. Um, and, you know, they're, they're kind of like there is a mechanism to do that. And, uh, you know, this kind of mechanism involves that, you know, so how do you find out, you know, like the positioning? Um, mm. You really should audit yourself. You should look at the whole experience. Remember walking in the customer's shoes. You know, I've done things like Secret Shopper, you know, um, you know, like say, for instance, we were working with a property developer who had many, many properties and they had lots of showrooms. So what I did or my job was is I went to every single one of them and pretended to be a customer and just to see how their staff and, and, and how the whole process works. Everything down to how was how was I greeted? Was I offered a drink? When did they give me the brochure? Um, what was the kind of uh, process and system that allowed me to find out information? How did they make me feel? You know, did they make me feel that, you know, I'm a valued, a valued uh, lead? Or did they make me feel, um, oh, actually, I'm really busy right now, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then even down to how many people follow through after I've made an appearance. And mm -hmm. the amazing thing was this developer has probably about 10 or 20 of these kind of development uh, sites. And out of all of them, I only got one person, one salesperson call me back. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So, you know, uh, this is information that's really good for the brand owner to say, okay, so what should the showroom experience be like? And what are my people doing, you know, when I'm not there, you know, and how does that kind of like co correlate to building that kind of brand experience? So, okay. So we do audits. We do the kind of, we do the walkthrough. We need to, you know, and, and, and you can do that yourself as a brand owner. You know, I, I don't know if you know that show called uh, The Secret Boss, I think it's called or something like that. Is that what it's called, really? See, the, the boss movie. What's the name? They, they go undercover. Undercover boss. Yeah. Undercover oh, boss. Oh, I want to watch that. Undercover. Okay. That one is really good because they, you know, they have people who go into their own companies. They, they, wear, a mis they wear a disguise. They have a persona. They don't, you know, they, they, and they experience what is it like to be an employee within their own company. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of simple truths that come out of it. Some discover some, some things that are very positive. Some of them discover some horrific things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that kind, of, that, that kind of understanding from the inside out is really important. Okay, mm -hmm. so I mentioned about we should review, review competitors. And that comes down to simply like, so what do they say? 
you know, what do they put on their website? What do they, um, you know, what's their showrooms like? What's the physical presence they have? What's their online presence? What's the messaging they use, you know? Um, and for me, because I'm the wordsmith, kind of I have to look at, you know, the, the language. And I, I literally do this. I take, you know, yeah. say I've got 15 or 20 competitors. I look at their websites. I look at all the leverage language that they use. I take out all those keywords and I put them on a page. And I look at which ones are used more often than others. And I say, this is what we're not going to say. <laughs> this is what we will not use this vernacular at all. We have to find other ways to talk about ourselves. And it's really interesting. It really changes the way in which the key elements of a, of a website would be built because no longer are you using similar phrasing, similar words, similar kind of uh, analogies. You're fairly focused on something unique and different. So where does that come from? I mean, we interview um, the brand owners, we interview their customers, we interview their partners, we interview other people that have a stake in that business. And depending on what it is, you know, if it's a utilities business, you know, you kind of have to interview people from operations, you have to interview people from their merchant networks, you have to interview people from, you know, their, their, their customer base. But, you know, if it's, say, for instance, an airline, right, who would you talk to? You had to talk to the people that deliver the service. You had to deliver, talk to the pilots, talk to the people who are the uh, online, uh, on ground staff. So it really depends on the tipple, the type of uh, company you're working for, and then yeah. what are you going to do with that? But from that comes a whole lot of really useful information. And you can think about that as helping you to develop your own vocabulary that you will then use in messaging. Well. So... For me also, an important part of this is it's not just about the brand consultant coming up with some clever ideas. It's actually, again, remember, it's about feelings. I want the brand owner to feel it. I want them to be excited about it. I want them to be vested in building their own brand because long after I've gone, they've got to kind of keep the momentum going. And this is not cheap. I mean, it costs yeah. money. Everything you do. If you make a change in a process, if you change the, you know, if you're going to retrain staff, if you're going to change a logo, you know, all that stuff costs money. So you have to be committed to the course, you know, developing those USPs, developing a story and developing the key messages then become kind of core elements of like the functional elements of that. And then, you know, think about now how, you know, again, when I was kind of like, when I was young, it was only three things that people did. It was TV, yeah. press, and radio, right? TV, press, and radio. Now, you know, we have such a, a huge uh, new media uh, a suite to choose from. Um, but I was really interested to find out. I looked into the facts of, you know, so what is the best channel to use? I mean, again, it depends on the target audience. Yeah. But, you know, in a general context, you know, 61% of people get their information online. Okay. Mm -hmm, sure. 17%, that's quite a significant difference, is broadcast TV. Mm. Um, something like 9% uh, is actually from gaming. So yeah. uh, I'm, a, I'm an avid gamer, so I, I, I kind of know that one. And 8% is from radio, uh, mm. and 6% is from print. So, you know, what, where do I spend my money? You know, uh, definitely, you know, 61% of people are, you know, the, 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 the media that they are looking at is an online media. So, you know, it automatically says to brand owners where they could be spending their money. But that's not to debunk all of the others because it really does depend on the kind of um, business you're in and the kind of target audience. So... Um, Another thing kind of, you know, moving forward is kind of like, how do I future-proof myself? Right? True. So, um, you know, um, the truth of that is, and, um, you, know, I, you know, if I think about, say, for instance, you know, the, the old adage in if you're in the, re if you're in the real estate business was mm. location, location, location. Yeah. So in, in the case of emotional branding, it's differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. Um, and, you know, uh, Remember we were saying about how you have to find the why. The why itself um, is something that has to begin on the inside. You know, if your own people don't believe it, how can you expect um, you know, everybody else to be, yeah. you know, to believe that it's true? Um, and, you know, we recently did a project for a very large property development company in, in Malaysia. Uh, they're called Sign Derby Properties. And, 
they 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 kind of their parent company is in palm oil and they have a lot of land so this land what they're trying to convert it is from you know low yield kind of farming agricultural products into property development so you know building townships building industrial um, um, real estate uh, building integrated developments and things like this and you know they've been around for 40 45 years uh, and they're the largest land owned land owner in Malaysia so when we started to talk up to them about you know what it is that they do the first thing I said to them is you're no longer in the property business Wow. You're now in. You're now in the sustainability business. Mm. Sustainability means that, you know, I have land. I don't just use it as and when I want. I look at how it's going to impact my country, my yeah. people, my communities. You know, if I'm building townships, you know, uh, am I, you know, am I thinking about it as a longevity? Do these people have jobs to go to? You know, sure. are they, you know, are they serviced by quality infrastructure and all of these kind of things? So, uh, you know, you know, you know, it changes your whole kind of mindset when you say to the, you know, the, the CEO of a property development company, you're not in property, you're in sustainability. But that change in vernacular means that they think about their whole value proposition in a very different way. So, um, you know, that's kind of like a, a one kind of way to look at it. Another example that uh, happened to be very recently is that we were talking to uh, a sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. So this, the sovereign wealth fund is kind of very disconnected. You know, if you're in the mm -hmm. industry, you know exactly who they are and they're, they're really good. But you know, for the, for the normal uh, mummers and puppers, they don't understand what it is they do. And if you read their website, it's horrifically um, oblique and, and uh, opaque. Mm -hmm. So um, they asked us to kind of do an initial recommendation. And so what we did was we looked on Green Door. So Green Door is a, is a site where you can look if you're a potential employee to join a company. And yeah. what, uh, what do other people say about them? <laughs> so it's really kind of, dis, you know, kind of um, interesting because you know, the way you handle one thing is the way you handle many things. So how you handle recruitment and what people think on the inside can really give somebody an insight to that. And in this site, you know, they compared this, we, we were able to compare the CEO approval ratings. So one, the, the company that we were talking about, their ratings were 48% versus someone like DBS Bank, whose CEO has a, 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 a rating of 92. So you see the difference, right? Yes. So, um, you know, I, I noticed the time, we're about two minutes to go. So I, I better do a quick, quick kind of wrap up and a, and a kind of, yeah. uh, uh, I had some other things I wanted to say, but uh, I'll I know, have to I save it for another day. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, okay. So my closing thoughts on this, um, you know, again, you know, I kind of use a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he says, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. So, you know, what I'm saying here in a connected world, really, if you're a brand owner, really think about what is compelling mm -hmm. and true. Uh, and there's an, a huge opportunity for Indonesian companies that look at emotional branding to take themselves forward. And I know that, say, for instance, a lot of uh, these people will feel uncomfortable, but it's when you are uncomfortable is actually when you develop and learn. So just like me today, I was very uncomfortable doing the webinar. I've never done one before. But again, it helps me learn and grow. And that's yeah. the same for brands. Wow. That's okay. amazing. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, I haven't bored everybody to death. Um, but uh, you maybe got no. some nuggets of that out of that. <laughs> and, so uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, I was going to say, you know, if, if you need any help and things, you can always email me. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you can share my email address with them. If, uh, if anybody has any particular questions that I wasn't able to answer in an hour.